Hello, this is Steve Ramona, your host for Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. I want to thank our sponsors, InPhone, and with InPhone, you can place your business on everybody's cell phone, turn their business into a web app, and with a click of a button, they'll have access to you 24-7. And also Pantheon.fm. Have you ever thought about monetizing and taking your podcast to the next level? Well, Pantheon can do that. Let us show you how. Reach out to Steve Ramona, the host, at info.co slash sr1, and I will go over with you how you can make your podcast really stand out. Let's enjoy the show. Thanks again, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. This is your host, Steve Ramona, and I'm excited to have my next guest on because staff is so important, but it's one of your biggest problems in business. If you're out there thinking, yeah, I agree, you need to listen to Jerry. Jerry, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. I'm really, really happy to be here. Well, I'm excited to talk about this because, like I said in the beginning there, staff's so important. You have a bad staff, it's going to hurt you. You have a good staff, it's going to help you. And there's much more involved. Why did you go to staff and retaining staff as part of your coaching? Um, well, my part of my coaching is to develop great leadership. And part of that is to great, develop a great culture. And the other thing is nobody ever quits their company. People quit their managers. So what if you could have a whole bunch of managers that are the cat's meow, the manager everybody wants to work for? Wouldn't you like to grow those, keep your staff, keep the the knowledge within the organization and use the staff to really guarantee customer loyalty because that's what the staff is all about. If you treat your staff well, then they'll treat your customers well. And when your customers are treated well, then they become loyal and Everything works much, so much better when there's customer loyalty. You know, there's um, you don't have to go out and find new customers. You get more revenue, and all those stats already exist. All those um, uh, studies have been done by McKinsey's of the world. And so, if you, whether you're a big business or a little business, if you can think about how do I keep and retain, how do I attract and retain, keep keep and bring on the new ones of the staff that uh, will make or break my company. And of course, if you bought a huge piece of machinery, you would probably buy a service contract. You'd make sure it was well oiled. You'd make sure that um, the you would want to preserve its life for a long time to get the best return on that investment. Well, you're making the same kind of investment in your staff only probably three times any equipment that you buy. And wouldn't it be great if you invested in those staff so they lasted a long time, so they did not only their jobs, but a super productive job, so they guaranteed that all your customers would come back uh, repeatedly and um, definitely make your whole life a lot easier because if you've got a lot of trust going back and forth between you as business owner and your managers and your managers and your employees, then the trust trust is the grease that smooths every operation. So attracting your standing staff, but not just the acts of doing that, but building the culture that makes everybody want to stay and makes everybody want to contribute and be super productive. That's what I'm after. Yeah, and the leadership's a big part of that. What's Do you work with the leadership and the staff or are you just focusing on the leadership when you're coaching? If a fish stinks, it stinks from the head, right? So I find the best results are to work with the leadership team and then, or the leader, the CEO. But then what happens is that person, whether it's a CEO or even an executive director of a nonprofit, they say, Jerry, this is great. Can you work with my my direct reports, my management team? And then of course I work with them. And then you've got a manager who says, this is great. Can you work and help me make other people here more productive? I certainly can. And, you know, and sometimes I get out on the bottom because that's where some kind of referral source is. And then I work my way up. Well, you know, I'm directing people to, well, what is the mission of your business? What are the values of your business? You don't know? Well, go ask your manager. And all of a sudden, the managers at the upper levels are more are involved in the coaching that's happening 
at a lower level, and then they see it's producing results, and then they want to spread it around. So it usually starts from the top, but it can also start from the bottom. I like that. I've heard that too many times where it's customized to where you, you're brought into it, and then you hopefully trickles up and down the leadership yeah. and, and the staff. That's really cool. What's servant leadership in your mind? Servant leadership. Servant leadership is about caring. It starts with caring. You have to have a state of being before you can have a state or have actions emanate from that. So the state of being, thinking of yourself as the servant, not just the servant slave who's going to do everything the master says, but the servant meaning my job is to care about you. My job is to empower you. My job is to help you be the, the best that you can be. And uh, not just because it serves my co company, but because I care about you. and just like I hope that you care about my son or daughter if they were to come work for you. Um, just like uh, I want the world to be a better place. So mm -hmm. I'm standing in my state of being of integrity and empathy. And, you know, the, if, if you read the Harvard Business Review's multiple articles, every article about leadership is about empathy and emotional intelligence. And so if you have a lot of emotional intelligence, and that comes out in your caring, it comes out in your empathy, it comes out in the actions that express that caring and empathy. People see it, especially if you're doing it authentically. You're not just doing it because it's a good business practice. Yeah. But <laughs> if you're doing it authentically, then you will um, you'll be endearing to the people around you. They'll want to stay, even if they have to take a... Uh, you've seen this during the recessions. People want to stay with the company. Everybody takes a... a 10% haircut just so they can keep everybody working and temporarily until, you know, the company can come back up or the economy can come back up. But caring leaders get rewarded by re caring in return. And when you have caring in return, you've got high levels of productivity and high levels of motivation, and high levels of morale and high levels of, oh, I want my friend to work here too. And uh, I'm I'm, I'm going to, I don't have to go work for the competitor across the street who offers me a 10% pay raise because my heart is here and I know this boss does right by me and I make a real good contribution. My identity is here. This is where I love and live to, I live and love to be. Especially nowadays, a lot of companies making it. That's the other now, which wasn't 10 years ago. I'm going to stay here because I know this company is going to make it where the one next door may not. And then you've got mm -hmm. nothing. Let me ask you, uh, I've heard this from CEOs, you may have as well, is I don't want to care too much. It may cause problems. What do you answer that? How do you answer that? I think you have to look at what kind of problems you're really thinking. I mean, there's there's a difference between friends and being friendly. So if you're going to make somebody a bosom buddy, then maybe it's not the best thing because that shows favoritism. It's almost like a uh, friendly nepotism, right? You're better off being friendly to everyone. But that being said, you know, you're know you different than the person who works in the other department, yeah. meaning you might like baseball tickets as a, as, a, as a gift sometime and somebody else might like a concert ticket. That doesn't mean you have to give everybody the same promotional incentive or um, gift of some kind. It just means that they should be of equal value and they should be distributed fairly. And you don't want to ever be considered playing favorites. Mm -hmm. But if someone needs to leave a half hour early because they have a, a, a problem with daycare with their kid, um, or somebody wants to have a half hour off at lunchtime because um, they have to go to run an errand, or somebody needs to come in late because of something going on at their home, it means that you you offer a flexible schedule that anybody can take advantage of. And that's good because that shows you care that people have a personal life. And I think what happened in the pandemic is a lot of people, and I'm not talking about CEOs, I'm talking about every worker woke up and said, oh, my life is more important than your business because you know I got people around me dying. I've got kids that are home from school. I got a Spouse is going crazy with all the stress. 
Um, you know, I've got parents who are in the hospital, you know, all these kinds of things came up and put pressure on people. And they said, well, if this job isn't going to be sensitive to my needs, I'm going to chuck it and go get a job that will be sensitive to my needs. Yeah, you're right. It opened doors, unusual doors, this COVID thing. That's still around. Mm-hmm. It's, we're still going through it. And I like the thing about care is you, you equally distribute the care, but again, don't make bosom buddies or best friends. Yeah. And you personalize it. Yeah. Yeah. What, besides caring, what's the biggest challenge CEOs have with staff and to retain them? Well, that's a multi-pronged answer to that question. so. (laughs) So I would say delegation is a big issue with most CEOs because they want to maintain control and maintaining control is the opposite of delegation. Now, because that's a multi-pronged answer, the other side of that is professional development for the employee. So employees want professional development. They want to um, have high expectations made of them. They want to be trained to grow and trained to excel and trained to um, develop critical thinking and um, management skills if they're in that, you know, a bent, have a bent in that area or more technical skills that they have bent in that area. So the fact is that when you don't delegate, you deprive people of their desire to grow and you make your own life miserable because you can't do quite so many things. And then you limit your business. You put a top heavy lid on your business because you've only got 24 hours in the day. And besides, the, you know, you create a divorce in your family <laughs> and your kids hate you if they don't see you enough. And so if you're going to have a work-life balance, you're going to have delegation, you're going to have um, a staff that can almost run the business without you. If you want all those things, that's the main thing that CEOs have problems with. Yeah. And all those three things get wrapped into one. And as an executive coach, when I'm working with people like that, um, and, and that's to everyone to some extent, um, we we talk about all those things and they get to see, well, yeah, how do I get out of this habit? And then we work on it, habits and what works for them and alternatives in different situations and then building accountability. I become an accountability partner as a coach. So wear different hats along that line in terms of asking questions that help the coachee come up with realizations and then some better options and then help them to utilize those better options often enough so they become a pattern. So I focus a lot on neuroscience. So in your brain, you've got highways. So if it's a high, if it's a, a nerve pathway you use all the time because that's your usual habit, then it's like a six lane highway and it's wide and it gets used and it's easy to send traffic down that. But when you want to develop a new habit, it's like a little path in the woods, right? The more you use it, the more it turns into a one lane highway and then a two lane highway and then four lane highway and then a six lane highway. Um, so I want, I like people to have these images in their mind so they understand what coaching is, that it opens up new thinking and then it opens up the ability to establish new patterns and habits. And then the old patterns and habits drop off and then it just causes the business to explode. Yeah. And how do I know that? Yeah. Because I'm a serial entrepreneur and I've seen it a zillion times, not only with the people that I coach, but with my own self. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And accountability is a big thing for coaching. So that's what you do. I mean, yeah, it's hard to change habits without somebody on your shoulder or, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. time schedule you have with them. Okay, Mm -hmm. we're fixing this habit. You're sleeping in, you know, (laughs) how did it look last night? I'm going to pick an easy one. But yeah, and that's what I want the audience to understand. You know, people see because there's so many coaches out there, but the accountability piece is the big, to me, one of the bigger parts. You hold them accountable. They change. Guess what? More income comes in and they're happy, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Let's and do- so I've been through all of that. Um, so I've started um, six businesses overall, currently running three. 
Um, and what I've seen is nothing that I haven't done myself. So I've been there of being the controlling person, having to learn how to delegate. I've been there where I wanted to plan a growth path for um, people in my staff and provide them with training. Uh, I've been there when I had to sell a business and, you know, I kind of give up a ba my baby and go through the whole process of um, finding the broker and then doing due diligence and then um, negotiating. Um, I've done that whole thing about how do we get more business? How do we promote it? How do we partner with vendors and use other people's money to promote the ven the business? Yeah. Um how can I um, best utilize the environment, the community? Um, how can I be a good contributor to the community and have that work in my favor as well as in the community's favor? Um, how can I have a caring servant's heart and still take myself into consideration because I'm still got to feed my family and, and, and draw lines? And, um, and then how do I put money into my left pocket and take it out to pay my right pocket. And then to, and and then, you know, how do I make payroll in a hard time? Um, yeah. So this is um, all part of living it, right? It's hard to um, give advice or even suggestions or even the right questions to someone who's the business owner. Now, if you haven't lived through it and asked yourself the same hard questions, right? You help with that. That's awesome. Before I forget, we're running out a little bit of time here. Just do a shout out how people can reach out to you. You've given us some great nuggets here to chew on. How can they get a hold of you? So they can reach me um, through my website, which is drivingimprovedresults.com. Or they can reach me by email, jerry, J-E-R-I, at drivingimprovedresults.com. Awesome. And of course, through LinkedIn as well. Yeah. And she's big on LinkedIn. It's how we met. So reach yep. out to her on LinkedIn. And I'm going to do even a little bonus. So the first four uh, listeners that reach out to you, I'm going to send them a $20 Amazon gift card. So just mention the wow. name of the show. Yeah, it's just, you're doing great stuff. We need people to talk to you. If it's an incentive, I'm all about that. Sometimes that would opens the door. And just reach out to her, mention the show, mention my name, either one, and she'll give me your contact info. And you don't have to, this is not purchasing. This is, just getting on a call with her to get to know her, mention the podcast, learn what these great things she's doing, and I'll take care of you. And so this is called the nudge, right? The nudge, you got it. Oh, it's a big nudge. Well, it's I guess twenty dollars is a good nudge. We all yeah. like Amazon, but yeah, mm -hmm. there's no there's no requirements. Just reach out, mention the name. The man, you meet with them five minutes or an hour doesn't matter. I just want them to talk to you. And if you're not part of the first four, still talk to her because if she can scale and grow your business. Why wouldn't you? At least get to know and That's see right. what happens. Um, CEOs, are they different than founders? Or do you consider them in the same category? Depends on the size of the business. So a founder starts the business, but the founder may not be the right person to scale the business. The founder is usually very entrepreneurial and, and takes risks and does things that um, uh, are about achieving passion, right? But somebody who's going to take a going concern and grow it looks in terms of processes, bringing on the best team, forming teams out of the people that have come on, um, looks at business succession planning, you know, all these things that aren't sexy at all to an entrepreneur. And so there are founders who can transition, but a lot of times founders who want to hold on to it. And I'm going to refer back to the baby, right? I was like that. Founders who hold on to the baby usually limit it because they don't have skills in management as opposed to leadership. They don't have skills in hiring the right people or they don't have skills in setting up processes and documenting um, operations and the kinds of things that uh, might be necessary to actually scale the business. And so we were talking just before about slow growth and fast growth. Yeah, slow growth, they might be able to grow a little bit and hire the right people and maybe learn some delegation skills. But if you really want to scale the business, you're talking about people hiring people that are not the people that you need now. 
you're talking about hiring people that you'll need to get to the 10x position you want to get to. And so it's a different kind of hiring. And the same thing with documenting processes and and uh, even setting up strategic partnerships and things like that, that entrepreneurs may not want to do because they, it's all about control, right? Yeah, it's and, and that's a great answer because founders can have an ego and they think I can do it all. Those usually fail. Mm -hmm. And I love that you, and that's part of your coaching, which I love. Yeah. Where are you? And the other thing, the other thing I want to bring up about that um, is that there's a difference between a default culture and a designed culture. Mm -hmm. So entrepreneurs are so busy getting their product or service ready and um, building a market and hiring the first few staff, which might not be good hires. It might be just their friends from business school. Um, that they're just, they're not even paying attention to culture, it becomes a default culture. Mm. Or as somebody who's really looking to take a, a business and scale it, they're saying culture is the most important part of this picture. So I'm going to design a culture around caring, around employees, uh, and attracting the best and brightest and most talented employees. And of course, a type people don't want to work with B and C type people. They want to work with other A type people. So you get a first couple of A type people, and then they're going to start bringing in other A type people that are going to really help you scale your business. So you have to really be careful. And then you have to weed out the bad apples sooner rather than later. If you want to have a culture that's really going to be responsive and right. be productive and motivated and generate a lot of morale. I like that. That's, that's again, well said. It, it, it's very, very important. Well, you know your stuff because you put yeah, it I out do. there today. You know exactly what you're doing. Again, reach out to her. Reach out to me if you have questions. I'll connect you with her whatever way, but just reach out because you never know that one opportunity door opens and big things can happen for you. Jerry, you are a rock star. Thank you for coming on, taking time and being on my show. Can I ask one more favor? Yeah. You've given us a ton of tips. One more great tip, but let's tie it into the journey. The audience is listening, their journey in business that could help them grow. Yeah. Well, this is a question to ask yourself, and every person should do it, young or old. Suppose I were to die tomorrow, got hit by a bus, whatever, not to be macabre, but just, you know, this is reality, right? And it's your funeral and four people were going to get up to give you eulogies. One of them is from your family. One is from a group of friends. One is from your employees. And one is from your community. What are they going to say about you? What do you want each of them to say about you? Do you want to be remembered for your leadership, for the great culture? And just to bring up a quote from Maya Angelou, people don't care what you say, people don't care what you do. People only care about how you make them feel. So how are you making these four groups of people feel such that they will give you the kind of eulogy that remembers you in the way that you wanna be remembered? I suggest you put down on a list, how do I wanna be remembered? You know list five to 10 things and then work every day to be the kind of person who can accomplish those five to 10 states of being ways of being so that your eulogies will measure up to how you want to be remembered. 